So one of my great joys is to get to introduce my friends to you all, my family of faith, and also get to introduce my family of faith to my friends. And so as part of our wild series, as I was praying about the series, I'm like, really, there's just one pastor that I think would be like the perfect guest speaker for the wild series, just because of who they are, how God uses them. And that's the person you'll have the pleasure of hearing the word from today, my good friend, Pastor Justice Coleman. Pastor Justice and his wife, Maria, founded 12 years ago a great church in LA called Freedom Church. And God is doing just such a great and unique work through this couple and through this church. One of the reasons that I find Justice to be so fun is because like Justice is one of those crazy guys where it's like, you know, he uh, he's, uh, gets uh, wins championships rolling Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You see him bombing on a mountain bike uh, down things nobody should be on a bike doing, you know, and, uh, and just got, they have three beautiful kids and just a great, great, great friend of mine. And so I've been trying to get him here for a little while. We finally were able to work it out for today. So because we love to appreciate the men and women who bring the word of God to us here at Crossroads, let's all rise to our feet. Let's give Pastor Justice Coleman the loudest Crossroads welcome. If you think you have the greatest pastors, come on. If you can't get the greatest pastors, can you make some noise? Uh, Pastor Daniel and Lynn are incredible. It's so great to finally be here. Please have a seat. My name is Justice. And uh, man, I've been friends with Daniel for 10 years. And to finally get to be with you is, is absolutely my joy. Um, turn to Psalm 23. And we're going to continue where Pastor Daniel took off, uh, left off last week. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And what a great message. I don't know if you watched it, but you can catch it on YouTube. But he talked about this idea of being content and how only God can satisfy. And he's so faithful and he's given us so much. He makes us lie down by, by green pastures. And I might, my, am I the only one in here who God has to make lay down sometimes? I mean, he's just like, lay down. Be, this is the next line. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. And I was looking at what that word means, restores in Hebrew before it was translated into English, and it's got some unique connotations to it. And it really means to, to give back, to return back, like something that was lost and then it's found again and it's restored back to somebody. And Jesus talks a lot about that, that concept. You know, Pastor Daniel last week connected Psalm 23 to John 10 where Jesus says he's the good shepherd. And here's another connection I wanna make to Luke chapter 15, where Jesus tells a story about a shepherd. And in Luke 15, he says this, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Hey, raise your hand if you've heard this one before. He has a hundred sheep and he leaves one. How famous is this? Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And everybody hearing Jesus tell this story is like, we all know shepherds and we understand the dynamic that you're talking about. And Jesus goes, if somebody has, you know, 99 sheep, and there's one out there somewhere, wouldn't he just leave the 99, what does it say, in the open country, and go after one? And everyone's like, no, that's not what a shepherd does, Jesus. Like, nobody would leave 99 sheep, they would maybe leave them in the hands of another shepherd, but they wouldn't leave them in the wilderness and then go find just one. Like, why would you, why would you do that for just one? That doesn't make sense. And he tells a story about how when the shepherd restores the lost sheep, he says, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. By the way, can we just give it up for the 45, I think, people who got baptized last week? How incredible was last week? A life that was lost, right, is now being restored back to the family of God through Jesus. And that's exactly what you celebrated last week, this restoration. He restores my soul. There's a shepherd who restores the sheep back to the flock. He brings it back, and then he throws a party for the sheep because he's so excited about it. Now, Jesus tells another parable right after that. And just to let you know, uh, in the first century, in the time of Jesus, he was a rabbi, and rabbis told parables, but when they would tell multiple 
parables back to back, don't you know they're just, a rabbi's drilling home one major point. And so this next parable that he tells is to just drive this point home even further. This one's not about a shepherd. It's about a woman who lost, not a, you know, not a sheep, but a coin. It says, uh, it says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. And the same way I tell you there's more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, you think it's wild that a shepherd would leave 99 and go after one now Jesus says, once upon a time, there's a woman, and she's got 10 coins. She's counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where's my 10th coin? And she starts sweeping and moving furniture, and she's trying to find the coin, and she's, you know, getting a little frantic. She starts going to her neighbor's house. Hey, have you seen my coin? Did I leave my coin here? Hey, um, did I, uh, a little coin, like this big, have you seen it? And she just goes around. She finally, after enough searching and hunting, she finally finds the coin, and she holds it up. She's like, my coin! My coin! She goes back to the neighbors. I'm throwing a party for my coin. Do you want to come? Do you want to come to my coin party? Everyone's like, what are you talking about? Coin party, my house, tell your friends, let's go. What kind of shepherd would leave 99 for one? What kind of woman would throw a party for a coin? Now, also, too, like, you got to understand this. Everybody realized this in the context when Jesus was speaking. Like, when you have people over to your house in Jesus' time, you had to provide food. You had to provide the things that would bring honor to the guests. It was not a cheap thing to throw a party and provide for everybody. The, the party that she would have thrown for the lost coin cost more money than the coin that was lost to begin with. So what is Jesus teaching us here? He's teaching us that in the kingdom of God, when something is restored, that has more value than maybe we understand. There's something about something being lost and returned that Jesus says, I want you to see God's heart. It's like a shepherd who'd leave 99 for one. It's like this woman who would, who would throw a, a party that was more expensive than the coin that she lost just to celebrate the coin. And then he throws this last parable down, and this really drives home the point. He's illuminating something here. It's this progression, and he hits this third story. Maybe you've heard this one before as well. There was a man who had two sons, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. You guys heard this one before? Once upon a time, he says there was a father with how many sons? Two sons, an older son and a younger son, right? And the younger son was kind of a punk. Any older brothers in the house? You know what I'm talking about? The younger, the younger one goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I have this idea, okay? Don't shut it down. Um, just think about this. You're wealthy. You got a lot of stuff. You got a lot of real estate. You know, you're doing pretty well. What if we just pretend like you're already dead? <laughs> I take my inheritance and I, I leave and I go do my own thing and I just spend it on what I want and I just set up my own life. And once again, everybody hearing this story is like, you told us about this wild shepherd and this wild person losing a coin. Now you're going to tell us about this wild dad. They're like, what kind of dad would do this? What kind of dad? would let his son rip him off like that, rip off his older brother, because he would have gotten even more inheritance in that culture. He would have gotten two-thirds. What kind of dad would, let, would endure the shame of all, everybody in the community seeing him do this, right, his son? What kind, of, what kind of dad would do that? Yeah, I don't know if you're picking up what Jesus is laying down, but there's also another way for a lost thing to be returned, and that is when something is lost and they don't realize that they're lost. You know, this, this, this sheep that was lost, maybe it just wandered off. You know, this coin that was lost, maybe it was just dropped somewhere by accident. But you could also get lost by running away. And I did that. I got lost by running away when I was like three years old. Uh, anybody ever run away from home or am I the only one? I just wanna make sure. Is this a safe place? Crossroads, is this a safe place? Okay. I remember I was three. I'm gonna tell you the most embarrassing story ever. I was three years old. And uh, we, before we moved to Los Angeles, we lived in Texas. And Texas, everything's bigger. And this backyard that we had, on the other side of our backyard was like the wild, right? It was like the wilderness. It, there was like mountains and trees. And there was, um, there was like a reservoir, I think, back there. I don't remember. But there was like a chain link fence that connected our backyard to the wild. 
And I, 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 one day I was three, and I just said, you know what? I can do better than this, and I left. And I just went under the fence, <laughs> and I went out into the wild. And I was exploring, and I was, you know. Um, and then the sun started going down. And then it got cold. And then I got scared. And I remember a lot of details because it was very traumatic. And I remember, I remember a search helicopter in the sky. Like, I remember that. Um, I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing these little overalls, these little Oshkosh Bagash overalls. <laughs> and um, I remember, this is really embarrassing, I remember peeing my pants and being cold, and, well, warm, but then cold. And then <laughs> I remember being like, like, um, Cuddle, like curled up next to like some, some like stacks of wood or, or boulders or something, I'm trying to remember, and just being alone and feeling lost. Because like I didn't mean, I got myself lost. Like I went out somewhere and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm lost now, right? I didn't mean to get here, but I can't find my way back. And that's what Jesus is saying in his third parable is once upon a time there was two sons and the younger son got himself lost. He left his father's house. And then he goes on to tell the story. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country. There he squandered his wealth in wild living. Turn the person next to you and say, wild living. And then just imagine whatever that looks like. Just imagine wild living. That's, don't Google image it. Just imagine whatever wild imaging. This is this kid. He's just lost. He's just doing his thing. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out, and he hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And at that point, when Jesus was telling the story, you know, people just started booing, right? Somebody got up and walked out. Church online clicked out. It's just like, listen, pigs, you've gone too far, Jesus. This is way too wild of a story. We Jews... Don't mess with pigs. Pigs are off limits. They're not kosher. We don't eat them. We don't touch them. They're unclean. They make us unclean. What's your point? Jesus' point was is that this younger son had traveled really far from home. And it's not just that he had traveled from his father's house, but he highlighted that he's with pigs, meaning he had traveled from his father's faith. He's way far gone. He'd forsaken what he knew about God. He had fors forsaken the way he was raised. He had gone as far away as Jesus could describe. And that's when he realized he was lost. And he gets hungry because of this famine and he's out of money. And so there's this guy who works in, you know, maybe similar to his dad, but in that country, you know, a big house, an estate, you know, real estate. And, 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 and he had servants. And he goes, maybe I, could, maybe I could work for this guy. And he finds himself with pigs and he's covered in pig stuff and he's gross, and he's nasty, and his stomach's rumbling, and he, like, tries to eat some of the pig food, and he just, that's called rock bottom. Anybody ever been rock bottom? Man, I've been rock bottom. And here, here he is. He's at rock bottom. So he, he says this to himself. He, he, says, he says, when he came to his senses, that's what happens when you're rock bottom, right? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And this really hits home for me, guys, because, um, you know, I was raised in a good family, and I went to church as a kid. But um, I don't know your story, but for me, I, I walked away from God, and uh, I ran away from God. And I got in a lot of trouble, and I made a lot of mistakes, and I did a lot of things that I regret. And I did things that hurt myself, and I did things that hurt other people. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we all have a story in this room, right? That's what I love about, about Crossroads. This is a church where there's, come on, no perfect people allowed. All of us are a work in progress, amen? All of us have something that's going on in our life. And we're not trying to hide it, but we're just not bragging about it, right? <laughs> And, and, and I, you know, I was covered in pig junk, you know what I mean? And I had, I, you know, I was nasty, and I came, I came to my senses the way this son did. And I remember the prayer. I was 20 years old. I got on my knees, and I just said to God this prayer. I said, God, the life that you, this is verbatim what I prayed. I remember it. I said, God, the life you've given me, I've butchered it. I've done a terrible job. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm awful at this. So, if you'll take me back, if you'll take my life, you can do whatever you want with it. 
And I said, I will just serve you. I expect nothing. I will just serve you. That's all I said to him, right? And uh, for those of us that have been following Jesus longer than 10 minutes, don't you know he has so much more in store for you than just being a servant? He wants you to be in his family. He wants to make you his son or his daughter. He wants your life not to be wasted. He has a purpose that he's inviting you into. He restores, come on, our soul. That's what he does. He's a faithful God. Has he been good to you? And he... He had so much for me. Everything that I have today, you know, um, my, my, my wife and my kids and our church and all the peace and all the, all, my soul, it's because of a God who loves me and he took me back. And I, I, I will serve him to the day I die. I, I love him so much. I'm so grateful for what he's done. But I can remember it like it was yesterday when I came to my senses. You know, at the end of this message today, I'm going to give people the opportunity to come to their senses, you know, to give their life to Jesus. And, um, because I just remember it like it was yesterday. So he takes the speech, and he says, I will go home, dad. I will go to my dad, and I will, I will be a servant instead of being a son. And he makes a speech, and he tries to clean himself off, and he, and he, and he heads home. And what's the dad doing this whole time while he's gone? It says, it says, but while he was still a long way off, verse 20, his father saw him coming. I, I think this is the best line in the whole Bible. I think this is, this is my favorite line in the whole Bible. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Picture this like wealthy nobleman who's important, who's got places he's supposed to be. He's got real estate transaction he's supposed to be doing. He's got businesses he's running. He should be like in a board meeting or doing something, but he's not busy. He's actually just posted up on his porch. It says while he's still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Imagine this big house with like an infinity driveway. <laughs> and he's leaning on the banister, and he's got his eyes locked on the horizon. And he's thinking, one day, my prayers will be answered, and my lost son will come home. While he's still a long way off, his father saw him coming. He was waiting for him. His eyes were locked. Is this the day? Is this the day I see my, my son's head pop up over the hill there and start walking up. And that was the day. While he was still a long way off, he's like, is that my, is that my son's dirty little stupid head coming up over the <laughs> driveway there? Dad, so you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, and the son just comes moping up, right? And he's covered in all the stuff, and he's, and he's just got all the shame, right? And he's walking through the neighborhood in which he'd embarrassed his dad and shamed his whole family in. And he comes walking up, and he's working on his speech. You know, he's like, Father... I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like your servant. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. And he's kind of practicing. He's getting the courage. And he looks up, and he sees his dad. And it says, while he's still a long way off, it says, his father saw him coming, and he was filled with compassion. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. He ran to his son. Is that my boy? And he just takes off, which is crazy because... You know, men like this father, they weren't runners, okay? Important people, it, it, they don't run, okay? They, they have people that run for them, okay? <laughs> he wasn't even dressed to run. He had like a long robe on, right? Beautiful robe, went down to the ankles, right? Men like this don't run, okay? They, they glide. They just glide. <laughs> they glide in the robes. <laughs> but he sees his son, and he's like, is that him? And you just get this picture of dad just like hiking up his man dress. You know what I mean? He's like, is that my son? He's got his robe hiked up. He's just like running to his son, you know? And there's, there's some uh, servant in the front yard with a rake. And he's like, I've never seen him run before. <laughs> and this other guy's like, I've never seen his ankles. <laughs> he's just running to his son. And his son sees the, his dad running. And he's like, oh, shoot. I've never seen dad run. He's coming at me. And he... And the Bible says, Jesus says, he, he gets half the speech out of his mouth. He's like, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he can say, just make me a servant, before he can say, I'll sleep in the barn, just dad comes in, just tackles him, kisses him. Jesus says he embraces him. Clearly, the dad doesn't care about all the pig rubbing off on him. He's more concerned about his love rubbing off on his son. And he just, I just grabs him, and he says, I'm so glad to see you. Just make me, look, one of your servants, you shut your mouth when you're talking to me. <laughs> you're not, 
Well, servants, what? You're home. And he tells one of the servants, he says, go up to the house. I need you to get me three things. First thing, if you're taking notes, he, he says this, bring the best robe and put it on him. Second thing, put a ring on his finger. Third thing, put sandals on his feet. Go up to the house to get the best robe. Who's got the best robe in the house? Dad's got the best robe in the house, right? Beautiful robe, tells the servant, go to my wardrobe, get one of my robes, bring it down here. He takes this robe at the edge of the driveway before they get back up to the house. He takes this robe and he just covers his son. All the dirt, all the mistakes, all the wild living, all the history, all the regret, all the shame, he just covers it with this robe. And there wouldn't have been a person listening to Jesus tell the story who wouldn't have remembered Isaiah 61.10, the prophet who said there would be a day when we would be restored back to God and we are covered in the robe of righteousness. We are covered in his garment of salvation. Friends, who is that? That's a picture of Jesus. Jesus covers us. He covers our shame. He covers our past. He covers all that, you know? We live in a world where celebrities say things like, you know, I just live without regrets, right? I'm just like, what? Like, if you had a time machine, you wouldn't go back in time and change things that you're not proud of or that hurt other people. You wouldn't have some do-overs. I just live without regrets. What, what kind of life is that? All of us have regrets. Are you with me? All of us have things that we wish we hadn't done. It's only through Jesus that we can be forgiven of all those mistakes. It's only through Jesus that we can be set free of all that shame. This robe that goes around him is like, listen, we're about to go up to the house, and I need to restore your soul. I need to restore some things before we get up there. Before we get back up there, I need you to put this robe on because I need everybody to see you the way I see you. You're my son. You're not your mistakes. You're not your past. You're not all that stuff. You're my son. Point number one, Jesus restores our identity. He brings us back into the family. It was lost when we ran away, and he brings it back. The second thing he says, he says, I want you to go up there and get what? What was the second thing? Do you guys remember? The ring. Why was that a big deal? The ring that he's talking about there is a signet ring. And a signet ring is the kind of ring that is only used by the father and the heads of the household, right? The older brothers. This is a ring that represents authority. It has a family crest on it. They would dip the ring in wax. I'm pretty sure it went on the pinky. Well, I'm not, it's not in the Bible, but I'm pretty sure it's a pinky ring situation. I just feel like it's probably a pinky ring thing. Maybe I listen to a lot of hip hop. All right. Um, it <laughs> dips the ring in the wax and signs, doc, you, you know, signs scrolls and documents and stuff like that. That's a picture of authority. What is he restoring? He's not just restoring him as a son. He's restoring the authority that comes with being an heir to all that he has. He says, I don't just want people to see you the way I see you. I want people to listen to you the way I want them to hear you. Everything that I have is still yours. You can have it. It all is mine. I give it to you. Somebody here today needs to be reminded of the promises of God for your life. That you are not so far from God. You're not so, you haven't, messed up so bad that you've lost his promises for your life. He's restoring all things. Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I give it to you. This is a gift. You are a son in the house of God. You're a daughter in the house of God. And the last thing that he says is what? He says, he says robe. He says, ring. What was the last one? Sandals. And that seems like not that big of a deal, right? Like, what's the big deal about sandals? But it was a big deal to the servant who was barefoot running up there to get the sandals out of the closet. Because servants were barefoot because they had a debt to be paid. If you were a guest, you wore sandals at the house. You'd take them off when you came in. If you were a family member, you wore sandals. But if you were on the property and you were barefoot, it means that you worked there because you had a debt to be paid off. You were an indentured servant. When the father says, put sandals on my boy's feet, he's saying, there was a debt, but it's been paid. I've canceled it. Come on, who the son sets free is free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is, come on, there is freedom. It's like, put, man, put a robe on my boy. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Look, this is my son. I'm restoring 
him back into the family. I'm restoring his freedom. God, some of you, somebody might just need to be reminded that all of your debt's been paid through Christ. That his cross, nothing that you've done is too big for the cross. Nothing needs to be added to the cross. Everything is fulfilled through the person and the work of Jesus. All that you need is in him. You don't need to throw yourself a pity party. You don't need to guilt trip yourself. You don't need to try to earn your right back into the family. All of that was done through everything that Jesus did for you. It's a gift. And you have that sonship and authority and freedom in Christ. Am I talking to any sinners today? I feel like, is there sinners here? Do you have any sinners? Don't cheer for being a sinner, but are there sinners in here? Jeez, I've been a sinner for a long time. Anybody else? Man, I can't I, actually, I can't remember the first time I've sinned. I remember the first time I've sinned. I was 18 months old. 18 months old. My brother had a son, okay? I'm going to go ahead and share this story, Pastor Daniel. It's a little embarrassing, but my brother had a son, and he moved in with us, okay? And so I was kind of like the center of attention until, my, until I became an uncle <laughs> at 18 months old, right? And I remember this little twerp just siphoning off all the attention in the family, right? Like, I used to be a big deal. Now he's a big deal. And everyone's like, oh, look at this little guy, right? Uh, I just can't believe I'm sharing this story. Um, one night, I was 18 months old, crawled into my brother's room where his son was sleeping, crawled up into the crib. I bit that fool on the head. That's what I did. <laughs> I haven't done it since. I'm in recovery. I've never bitten another child. But we all have a past. <laughs> Who taught me to be jealous at 18 months old? Who taught me to be violent at 18 months old? Who taught me this stuff? Dude, I was born in a broken world. I have been shaped by brokenness and hurt. I have lived in a world that is falling apart. Anybody else? And if it wasn't for Jesus and his work and his redemption, would I even have a shot at being able to see clearly the grace of God? God saved me from my self. And this moment where he comes to his senses and he comes back and he gets this, this robe and he gets this ring and he gets these sandals, crossroads, that's called grace. It's called mercy. Come on, grace is when we get what we don't deserve. Are you with me? Or what we do? Mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. And this is a picture of God saying, "Hey, listen, this is not something that you couldn't get here by yourself." But what's interesting about this story is, remember, it's the third story. The first one was about a shepherd that left everything and hunted and and and, and found and rescued the sheep that was lost. The second one was about a woman who lost a coin and tore up her house and went to her neighbors and searched until she found the coin. So when Jesus is telling the third parable, don't you know everyone's like, well, how does this tie into the first one? Um, did, and didn't you say there was two sons? Because there is a second son. There's an older brother, right? And how does the older brother feel when little Johnny comes home? Like, oh, awesome. That guy who uh, ripped off Part of my inheritance and took off with it. Spent it on wild living. Awesome. Hope he remembers our secret handshake. Glad to see you. What is he? No, he's not thrilled, right? And the dad is like heartbroken because he wants the son, the older son, to see his heart. And it says that he, 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 meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked, what's going on here? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had him back and safe and sound. The fattened calf, um, that was a big deal. The fattened calf was the one they were saving for the biggest parties. If you kill the fattened calf, you were having the kind of party that you would invite the whole neighborhood to. This dad's throwing a rager for his son. Are you with me? He's like, I want everybody. I want everybody who saw him disown me and saw him shame me, I want everybody to see me take him right back because I love him so much. And he has this big party for his son. And there's music, this Bible says, and there's dancing, but the older brother's not there. He's outside the party. And he says, meanwhile, the older son was in the house. 
So he called one of the servants and he asked, verse 28, the older brother became angry, refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. You guys see this, how the father goes out to meet the younger son and then he goes out to get the older son? Like he's going back and forth. He's thinking about the sons. He cares about his sons. He says, your older brother became angry. So the father went out to plead with him. But he answered, father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. Never even ordered me a pizza. But when this son of yours, don't miss that. He doesn't call him my brother, does he? He says, this son of yours, that's what he says. Because he's dead to him. He's not his brother anymore. When this son of yours, you hear the disdain in his voice? Who has squandered your property with prostitutes has comes home, you killed a fattened calf for him. My son, the father says, you've always been with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. He's re being restored to the family. And son, if you knew my heart, you would know that there's no bigger deal in the world to me than this. I've been waiting and praying for this day. Haven't you seen my heartache? Jesus teaches us that in the kingdom of God, lost things are valued differently. A shepherd will leave 99 for one. They'll throw a party for a coin that costs more than the coin that, that was lost to begin with. The, the dad will drop everything and, and, and forsake even his own reputation just for this lost son to come home. How would you miss that? How have you missed that? I wonder if the Holy Spirit would ask any of us today, have we missed that? Are we lined up with the Father's heart? Have we missed that? Some of us are older brothers and older sisters in the Crossroads family, amen? Have we missed that? But what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's not just pointing to us, those of us that have been in Christ and been a part of this church family for a while. He's pointing to himself. He's saying that there's a, there's a shepherd that leaves 99 for one and there's a woman who does, searches and finds the coin, he's saying, you, you need to be found too, but in order to be found, you need somebody to go rescue you. Because there is an older brother, the firstborn of heaven, Jesus, who left heaven and came to earth for us. We were lost. We were gone. We were so far gone that we never would make it back if it wasn't for him saying, you know what, Father? Father? Send me. I will go and I will meet them where they are. And that's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is explaining salvation through the story of a shepherd and his sheep and a woman and her coin and the dad and his sons. And he's saying, somebody needs to rescue you. You need a big brother. And this is a picture of the Messiah. This is the picture of the God who would endure all the shame that we've put on him that would give us first chances, second chances, third chances, infinity chances. This is the God who says, you know what? I'm not gonna lie to you and pretend like you're not dirty and covered in all sorts of pig nastiness. But I'm also not gonna tell you to get cleaned up before you come to me. I'm gonna come to you. I'm gonna clean you up so I can bring you to the Father. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Doesn't he say that? In other words, nobody else is coming to rescue you. And what a message to say in this day and age. So many people don't like that message. They go, you can't say that Jesus is the only way. I'm not saying Jesus is the only way. Jesus said he's the only way. He said, I am the way. You don't know where to go? Jesus is the way. I am the truth. You don't know what to believe? Join the club. But we can believe this. Jesus, he is the truth. You don't know where to, you feel dead? You feel like you're too far gone? He says, he is the life. He's the life. This is a promise. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. In other words, nobody else is coming for you. Nobody else is going to rescue you. Nobody else cares that much about you. I was at the gym the other day with a friend of mine. He's Muslim. And we were working out, and he was just telling me how awful it was in the country that he came from. And he was just so burdened for his country. And he was about to make a trip to go back and see his friends and family. And he goes, I've read the Quran. I've read the, the, the Bible. I know that when things get really bad, God sends a prophet. Why hasn't God sent a prophet yet? And I looked at him right in the middle of his bench press. And I said, he already came. He's here. 
And I want to respect whatever worldview you bring into this place, but I also don't want to compromise this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. And when he says in John 10 that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he comes to give life and life more abundantly, he's talking about restoring everything that the enemy ever tried to take from you and giving you so much more by bringing you into the family of God. Not just to forgive you of what you've done. That would be enough. If God just forgave me of what I did and never blessed me again, hey, would anybody else say that's enough? Like, like if God never blessed you again ever, would you say everything you've done for me is already enough? But he has so much more. He wants to put the ring on your finger. He wants to share what he has with you. And he wants to remind you of you are, in his eyes, the best version of yourself. He doesn't see your past. He doesn't see all those things you did. He doesn't, he sees you as his son or as his daughter. And he sees a great future for you. Will you stand to your feet? I don't know what happened to the son. Jesus tells a story and we don't know what happened with the son. But I remember when I was three years old and I ran away from home. And I remember I got lost because of myself. Nobody lost me, I lost myself. Can we have church? I ran away. And I remember being the sun going down and being cold and being terrified and being alone and it being dark. And I remember a search helicopter looking for me and I remember wearing my little overalls. And I remember, I remember peeing myself and I remember being soiled and cold and gross and just terrified. And that's when I heard the sound of my salvation. I heard it. I heard it coming for me. And it sounded like this. And I'm like, what is, I know that sound. It's the sound of a 1983 Yamaha dirt bike that belonged to my older brother who was out searching for me. And I remember him flying over this hill. And I'm like, Jason. And he pulls up. He's like, get on. And uh, I'm like, I can't. And I was like all like wet and I pee and I was so embarrassed. I was like, I, I, I said, don't touch me. And he just looked at me as my big brother, and he just, just grabbed me by my little Oshkosh Bagosh straps. <laughs> and he picked me up, and he put me on his lap. And he put his arms around me. And he just drove me right into the arms of my father. And it was the biggest smile my mom and my dad had ever had on their face. It was the greatest day of their life. It went from being the worst day of their life to the best day of their life. And I just want to tell you, if you're here today, and you've never let the big brother of heaven, come on, you've never let Jesus do what he came to do, which is to save you and bring you to the Father. Today is your day. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? Who needs to come home today? In just a few minutes, we're going to go back into this song. You can bring the worship team out. We're going to sing about the faithfulness of God. But who needs, to, who needs to come home to Jesus today? You've never made that decision. You know, maybe, you've, maybe you're watching online right now because you're not ready to come to church yet. I'm just so glad you're watching online. Maybe this is your first time in church in years. I don't know. Maybe you've been coming to Crossroads for like a year and you've just been like waiting for, you mean you've been holding back your heart? And, and somebody today's just gotta go, I'm not gonna hold my heart back anymore. I'm not gonna hold my heart back anymore. And Jesus doesn't tell you, you know, get cleaned up and then come to God. He says, I will meet you where you are. As far away as you think it is, I will meet you where you are. Trust me, he left heaven and came to earth for you. He'll, he's traveled a great distance for you. It's not too far for him. He will meet you where you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. He will change your life. He will restore your life. He will bring you into the family of God. He came to this earth, lived the life of a human being, perfect and sinless, 100% God and 100% human, perfect and sinless. He died on the cross for us, because somebody needs to answer for the bad things that we've done. And he said, I will do that for you. I'll die the death that you deserve. And then he rose again, declaring that he truly is, who exactly who he says he is. He's God, that resurrection life is found in him, that everything he said about himself is true and that you have a future. And if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, 
today and say yes to him. Would you have the courage with every eye closed and every head bowed? To just raise your hand wherever you're at so I can just see you. Just raise your hand. Just the courage to raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see hands going up around the room, looking this way. Raise your hand. I see your hand going up. Anybody else? I want to give my life to Jesus today. I see your hand and your hand and your hand. Anybody else in the back? I see your hand. Raise your hand. That's me. I'm giving my life. I'm saying yes to Jesus today. I don't want to hold my heart back anymore. I don't want to hold my heart back anymore. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Awesome. You put your hand down for a second. I want to do one more invitation. You know, maybe you're compelled. If you guys would open your eyes. Maybe if you're compelled to be more like Jesus and say, you know what? When you were talking about the older brother and his responsibility, it was like, I feel like I've drifted from my older brother responsibility. I feel like there's people in my life that are lost, you know, neighbors and coworkers and friends and family. And you know what? I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being the older brother like Jesus that would take responsibility for the Father's heart and go find them and seek them. I just want to know if there's anybody on your mind right now that you're thinking about. If you have somebody on your mind that's far from God, would you just lift a hand to them? Just somebody who's far from God, somebody who's really distant, Maybe somebody that you gave up on on accident. You didn't mean to, but you just stopped praying for them. Somebody in your life that you know, that's why God put them in your life, because they need to hear the gospel from you. They need to know God's love from you. Let's just pray for that person. Keep your hand up for them. Lord, we just pray for every person in our life that is far from you. Lord, would you help us be like you, Jesus? You said you came to seek and to save those who are lost. Lord, would you put that passion in us again? Lord, would you just line our hearts up with you, Father? Because if that's so near and dear to your heart, that's what we want on our heart. If that's what breaks your heart, that's what we want to break our heart. So Lord, we lift them up for you right now and we just ask that you would help us share the gospel and share your love with them. In Jesus' name.